should be very proud of yourself. Uh, I have heard that you make something three weeks in. Wow, okay, these people are just leaving. There's no, they're not going. Um, <laughs> like, nope, not going to be proud of me. Um, and so next week, we're going to wrap up the Trinity, okay? Uh, because everything you need to know about it, we've covered in four weeks. No, uh, we'll wrap that up, and we'll be talking about the Godhead. And so what we mean by that is how the persons of the Trinity kind of interact or relate to one another. We'll also get into some of the heresies, uh, which is always interesting and fun because whenever you try to explain something, you will do it wrong, and the church has done it wrong numerous times, uh, and so we're going to look at that. Also, I want to point out very clearly something that happened last week that has happened once only in my life, and it was last week. I was right about something, and my wife was wrong, and that has to be pointed out right here, right now. <laughs> He's actually right, and I, you don't have to worry. About, I, I'll explain it in okay, a little great. bit if you want to explain it so that I can claim what I, what I actually did wrong. Fair, fair okay, enough. Okay, okay. She just wrested control out of that moment from me. Like, if you want to know, like, how to, like, control the, the narrative, that is a textbook lesson <laughs> in how to control the narrative right there. Um, the Nicene Creed also, I think, is included in handouts for them, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have on the, the back uh, sheet of your handouts today, we have a uh, helpful resources section. Uh, I will talk through, that's the diagram I referenced last week where I was wrong. Again, I was wrong. There you go. You oh, here. sorry. I was wrong. And <laughs> you're on camera. Oh, oh, that's right. We're supposed to be on camera. Um, and the Nicene Creed is also there. That is just there because we'll, we'll reference it a bit today. And it's also what we have been referring to the last two weeks that, you know, it, kind of the, one of the standards of Christian orthodoxy. And, and if you look back, you should, again, be proud of yourselves for what you've gone through. Hopefully you can f appreciate some of the statements that are there, especially at the beginning of the Nicene Creed, a little bit better. All right, so let's do a brief recap, and very brief. Um, so like I said, we're three weeks in. So what did we talk about the first week? God the Father, great. What is that? Who is that? What does that mean? Any? Creator, Creator yes. What's, what's a quality or characteristic we learned about God that we talked about? Omniscience, yes. Somebody on this side of the church. Omnipotence, there you go. You can just throw omni in front of anything and be, be pretty good to go, right? All right, so that, that's called theology proper. That's how we described it. It was theology proper. And we talked about God's divine and his moral attributes. And we talked about his works. Can anybody name one of his works? We mentioned creation. What's another one? The other... There's three, but there's one other big one. It involves a cross. Salvation, redemption, yeah, that's the other big one. And then providence. We talked about Christology. So this is God the Son. We talked about his divinity, his humanity, his works. And then we talked about his return ever so briefly because, shameless plug, in a couple weeks we'll start eschatology together. And then today we're talking about the third person. Now this is very important. The third person person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a he. Uh, if you take nothing else away, don't call him it. Call him he. Use pronouns. Actually, it is a pronoun. Um, but yes, anyway. So today's going to be a great time. I'm excited uh, about Daniel being here with us, uh, as well as my wife, Kim, who's in the middle of, again, I want to praise my wife for just a second, if I can. She's taking her comprehensive exams for her PhD this week. So she took one on Friday, she's taking a breast of them this week, and I think, what, Monday? Yeah, Monday or Tuesday. And she is also here because she wants you to, to be able to have this. And so uh, grateful for her uh, and, and her work and for putting all this together. So I'm going to go. Uh, i got to go be in big church. So, um, yeah, you guys have fun. Thanks, love. All right. Um, so just to out – so he, uh, he did the recap – Today we're talking about God the Holy Spirit. Like he said, you can just go to lunch right now. If you learn that you don't call the Holy Spirit it, you say he. 
you're good to go. That's kind of one of the big things, big takeaways. Uh, just an outline of what we're going to talk about today is, I had it here, but now it's not here. Um, we're going to talk about who the Holy Spirit is. Ooh, that's, that's my section. What's your section, Daniel? I'm going to be talking about actions ascribed to the Holy Spirit, things he does in general, and the way that he works in the life of the believer, uh, the way that he moves uh, among us. Okay, so who the Holy Spirit is, the actions of the Holy Spirit, and how he impacts our individual personal lives as believers. That is the outline of where we're headed. So I am going to pray for us real quick before we dive in, because I always want to ask that the Lord keeps my mouth shut when I'm talking about these things if he needs to. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for um, just this opportunity again. I always say that it is a privilege because it is. And we just ask that um, the things that we talk about today, the things that Daniel and I say are true. And if they're not, we pray that you would just have all of us forget it before we walk out of the door, Lord. And we just ask that um, this discussion of theology would lead, lead to doxology, would lead to worship of you, and that it wouldn't just stay in our heads, Lord, that it would go out into, um, and just go out through our hands and our feet and go out and um, spread your kingdom. And we just ask that you would be glorified in this. In your name, amen. All right, so who is the Holy Spirit? The first thing we've already said a couple times is he is a person. Uh, can anybody think of some of the descriptions of the Holy Spirit in the Bible that might not make us think he's a person? Like a wind. <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah. Wind. What other, what other imagery of the Holy Spirit do we see in Scripture that maybe makes us think he would be more like a force rather than a person? Go ahead. Ghost, ghost, yeah. There's also uh, fire, you know, the fire at Pentecost. There, uh, scripture also talks about being uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit being poured out. So it almost sounds like a liquid, that kind of situation. Uh, or a seal. The Holy Spirit is a seal. Well, that's not really a person. So we are not, I repeat, not going to go into a philosophical discussion on what personhood is. Tragically, I have to do that in two days <laughs> on my second comprehensive exam, but I promise you, you don't want to go through that. So we're not going to talk about that today. So for our purposes today, when we are talking about a person, what we, what I mean and what we mean and what I would encourage you to proceed in your life as um, understanding would be that a person is, um, is a being in a dynamic relationship. That is what it means to be a person. So you, you and God and the whole, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and your daughter, all of those um, things are beings in dynamic relationships. So that means there's give and take in a relationship. All right, so our task then uh, right now is to look at the accounts of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament and say, okay, so, so far, you know, the, some of the things we talked about makes it seem like perhaps the Holy Spirit is a force. What do we see? Do we see any kind of dynamic relationship, elements of relationship ascribed to the Holy Spirit? So I would like, if you have your Bibles, I don't, <laughs> but if you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn to John 16. And we're not, we're not going to read through the whole thing or anything like that, but I do want you to see because all throughout this chapter, uh, we, uh, this chapter is just really key for our understanding of the Holy Spirit and it's particularly for our understanding of the Holy Spirit as a person. So he is, um, in this chapter, this is where Jesus is telling the disciples that he's going to go, but don't worry, I'm going to send one like me who will be even better, that, that passage, that um, conversation. So in that, in, so Jesus, who we believe, we've already talked about, is the second person of the Trinity, is talking about this spirit that he is sending 
who is like him. So he's likened to the same kind as Jesus. Um, his actions can be predicted because Jesus is saying he will come. And, and so um, the idea of your actions being predicted, there's a sense of there's a sense of relationality there of like, I know this person is going to do this. Um, so again, this is all a, that's not like the only defense. This is all like a building a case. Uh, so he is likened to the same kind as Jesus. Jesus is a person. He, his actions can be predicted. He will teach, bear witness, and guide the disciples. So teaching, bearing witness, and guiding all kind of have more relational undertones to them. Um, and, and he would be in relationship to the disciples as he does those things. He will uh, convict the world and declare Christ's message to it. So again, he is in relationship to the world as well and will be interacting with it in conviction and declaration of the gospel. And he will glorify Christ. So again, he's in relationship to Christ as well as the disciples in the world. So John 16 is, a, is an important one for the personhood of Jesus. Or I'm <laughs> personhood of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and another important passage is Romans 8. We uh, also see kinds of re relational terminology. When Paul is talking about the intercessory work of the Holy Spirit on behalf of believers... Um, so essentially, the Holy Spirit is working as a relational communication mediator between God and humanity. So that, again, gives this idea of relationality, personhood. Somebody is doing that. And then finally, Ephesians 4.30 talks about the grieving of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't think you can grieve liquid or a seal or a fire you can't really grieve it. You grieve a person. So uh, what do we make of the impersonal terms then? It, language is funny. <laughs> but think about, um, we, we speak about people like this all the time. You know, I poured myself out to him. She answered it like a whip, like something like that. We, we use imagery as we talk about people. So when, when this is just a key um, the fancy word is hermeneutic, but it means interpretation. As we read scripture, uh, one of the keys that we need to always have in mind is, yes, we, would, we want to have as plain and literal sense of a reading as we can, but, and this is very Reformation theology, Martin Luther was the one who came out really hard on this, scripture has to interpret scripture. So we don't allow just one verse or these one ideas to have us question, you know, question everything, like we talked about even last week with um, kenosis theology, Jesus emptying himself, and they took that one verse, and they extrapolated and made this whole theology, and you say, yeah, but that's not, it, that doesn't work in any of the rest of scripture, so scripture has to be involved in, in interpreting scripture. All right, um, so my presentation is that scripture requires us, and what we just talked about in scripture, these other passages require us to make the Holy Spirit more than a personal, uh, an impersonal force. He is a person. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit is a person, and he is fully God. So this is the, uh, in the Nicene Creed, this is together with the Father and Son, uh, the Spirit is adored and glorified. So that's that line. He's talking about uh, the Holy Spirit being fully God. At this point, you have heard us go, <laughs> you've heard us go through divine attributes for every single person of the Holy Spirit, so it shouldn't be a surprise that when we're talking about uh, the, the Spirit and we're talking about how we understand the Holy Spirit to be God or why we understand him to be God, we look at whether scripture attributes the attributes of God to him. And so uh, Psalm 139 uh, the Lord and the Spirit seem to be equated, and uh, the Lord, uh, Psalm 139 is, um, you know, I knit you in your mother's womb. That is, so the idea is that, like, he is everywhere, and and so Lord and Spirit, and Lord is the, from the, fir for those of you who are here in the first session, the big, the big Lord, the curious, like, Old Testament version of Yahweh, Lord and Spirit are equated there. Um, lost my place. Sorry. 
All right, and so we kind of see om omnipresence there, that attribute of omnipresence. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.10 says, He knows the thoughts of God, the Spirit, knows the thoughts of God and searches those depths. Well, I don't know who this Spirit is, but if he knows the thoughts of God and can search the depths of his thoughts, then either he is greater than God or he is equal with God. So we, we see uh, um, omniscience there. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 11 talks about uh, the spirit distributing the gifts of God as he wills. Once again, he would not have the authority to distribute the gifts of God of his own volition unless he too is equal with God. And so we see omnipotence there. So we see divine attributes, and then we see the, the clearer just declarations, equations, uh, particularly Matthew 28, 19. Can somebody tell me 28, 19? Very good. Baptizing them in the Father, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It would be very odd for the Holy Spirit to be put right in line with the Father and the Son if he was not co-equal with them. Uh, that it, it would be almost irrational. <laughs> it wouldn't make any sense, um, especially because Jesus is the one saying it. And then uh, another very clear and p potentially the most clear uh, equation or statement of the Holy Spirit's deity would be in Acts 5.4. This is when Ananias and Sapphira, everybody familiar with that story, they lied about a gift they were making to the church, and they dropped dead. And um, the disciple, I think it's Peter, but I, I can't remember. Uh, the disciple says, you, he said in his response, at one point he says, you lied to the spirit, and then he uh, finishes it up saying, you lied to God. And so it seems like there again is an equation a declaration of the Holy Spirit's a deity. So, hopefully I proved that to you. Any questions on the Holy Spirit being a, a person or fully God? Maybe I should be a lawyer. I made my case. All right. Um, all right, the final thing I'm gonna chat about today is the Holy Spirit being eternally sent. <laughs> You're going to have to stick with me because we're about to go into like medieval, like early church theology and it's going to, yeah, it'll be fun. Um, this is the stuff I love. All right. So eternally sent in the Nicene Creed would reflect uh, the phrase proceeds from the father and the son. That's the, that's the key. Uh, proceeds from the father and the son. So this means that the father and the son eternally send the Holy Spirit and he operates in concert with the one will of God. So the three persons all have one will. Um, let's not get into Jesus on that one, this row. Don't ask me about that. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay, sorry, I made a joke. Travis is good at cracking jokes and still keeping his his like train of thought, I'm not at all, so I shouldn't be cracking jokes, ow. Okay, uh, the, this, the important part here is that we are saying that the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds, so has always, does, and always will proceed from the Father and the Son. And, it's a hotly, hotly debated topic as to whether that is or is not true. Um, particularly in 1054 AD. Does anybody know what happened in 1054 AD? Anybody? Look at you, yeah. The, the Great Schism. So that is, if you wanna be fancy at like a dinner party or something, here you go. 1054 is the, is the great schism where the East, the Eastern Church, which we now know to be the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the West, which eventually became Roman Catholicism, but we would, our tradition is in the West, the East and the West split at this point, and they split over this concept, the idea of the Son eternally, um, the spirit eternally proceeding from the father and the son. 
So the Nicene Creed you have in front of you is actually altered. That is not what it looked like in 325 AD when it was settled on. The, uh, where it says that it proceeds from the Father and the Son, in 325 AD, it only said proceeds from the Father. Now, uh, the change, oh yeah, the eternal, the problem in the gray area and where they're disagreeing is because the only way that we really know about the relationship between the persons of the Trinity is through Scripture, which is in time. And so the only things we know about how they relate to one another are about how they are relating to one another within time. But, but if you say that he's eternally proceeding, you're making an eternal, you're making an eternal assertion. And so the West said, well, we understand the concern, but we think that this best, uh, um, best accounts for scriptural passages about the Holy Spirit and, sorry, about the Holy Spirit and the Son and Jesus. And, um, and so we're not saying, yeah, I'll get to that in a second, sorry. All right, so the East said, listen, we can't go there because if, if the Spirit is proceeding from the Father and the Son, it makes it seem more like he's a force and it's really just a God of two persons with this force that they're sending out. And we want to assert and hold to that he is a person. So the East was trying to defend the personhood of the Spirit and they were saying it was a slippery slope if you started saying that the Spirit proceeded from the Father and the Son. This is all relevant, I promise. It's not like the angels like dancing on the head of the pin. I know it sounds like it right now, but we'll talk about why it matters in a second. All right, and so the West was saying, hey, we are not saying that he's not a person. Stop accusing us of that. We're trying to account for these passages in scripture. And those passages are Matthew 28, 19, which we already talked about, because Jesus says, the Holy Spirit whom I send. Well, what do you do with that if you're not going to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds, is sent by the Son? Also, John 15, 26, Jesus is speaking, and he says, when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. Okay, well, that's another one that is a concerning if, if you're in the East, you're going to have to explain, okay, well, what does that mean? And then the final one is John 20, 22. And um, uh, John 15, 26, when the helper comes, I will send, whom I will send to you. And then John 20, 22 says that um, this is right before Jesus is uh, ascending. It's kind, of, it's kind of the great commission in John. It says, and with that, he, Jesus, breathed on them, the disciples, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So it really seems like there are some biblical passages that need to be accounted for with regard to the relationship between the Son and the Spirit. And the great schism is two different interpretations and concerns about two different emphases. Um, like I said, <laughs> It sounds really like, oh my goodness, who cares? I mean, like maybe, but we don't even know. You know, um, and sometimes theologians get into those conversations. But this one could actually be quite relevant even now because it is a, because part of an implication, if, if, if it were to just be the father with the son proceeding, and the spirit proceeding, and the Eastern Orthodox Church kind of describes it as the two hands of God the Father, would be the, the Son and the Spirit. If you, if you have that men mentality, if you have that concept in your mind, then you are opening yourself up to the possibility that, the, um, that God could reveal himself and work in the world in a way that is separate from Christ. Is everybody tracking that? So this is currently the argument being made 
or one of the arguments being made for pluralistic religions, the idea that all roads lead to God, all roads lead to, to like God the Father anyway, because his spirit has gone out, and it, it's manifested itself in a different way in these different religions. Because, because if, you ha if you separate the spirit from Christ, then it doesn't have to all be through Christ's, through Christ's atonement on the cross and his resurrection. The spirit can work, and there's a you know, direct line, so... That's a terrible way to say it with regard to the relationship of the Trinity. But there can be an interaction with God that is separate from Christ. And that is part of what the West was trying to keep from happening. So you can appreciate that it's actually a relevant argument even now, hopefully, because people are making it for, hey, all roads lead to God. And, and not, it doesn't have to go through Christ. And as inheritors of the Western tradition, though we would disagree with the Roman Catholic Church on quite a few things. We, I would encourage you to agree with them on this, that the Holy Spirit does proceed from the Father and the Son, because we see it in Scripture, and we also recognize that there are some pretty serious, um, there's some pretty serious implications if that's not the case. Any questions on that? Did you enjoy the trip back to 1054 AD, and even before. In the East defense, one other quick thing. Um, oh, I don't know if I'm going to ask you, let you ask questions. Just one second. Um, uh, in the East defense, the schism was not just about the filioque. That's, uh, that's the Latin term for and the sun. Um, and yeah, it's just a huge term. It's, it wasn't just over the filioque. It was also um, because the West changed the Nicene Creed without talking to the East. And so they changed the very fundamental fundamentals of orthodoxy without anybody else. And because the Bishop of Rome considered himself kind of the ultimate authority, he felt like he could do that. Whereas in the East, they lead through a plurality of leadership. Even now, they have patriarchates that they, they don't believe in just one person having infallible, at that point it wasn't infallible, but just having the power and the authority to make that declaration. So the West, they were kind of being squirrely and not very awesome. Um, so the East, when it came to, there were lots of politics going on, so when it came to them discovering that they had done this to the Nicene Creed, they were like, we're out, we're done. And so it was over more than just this, but this was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yes. Okay, the question was, was that the only section of the Nicene Creed that was changed? I believe so. Are you aware of anything else that was changed? Um, no, especially in regards to this. Yeah, it was not, it was for sure, not with the schism. Yeah. Yes, um, if, it, if it is like that, then yes, it would be some, whoever was typing out <laughs> the, the creed, whoever was passing on the creed in whatever way was signaling that not everybody has always agreed on that specific phrase. Yeah, and uh, I, I typed up the creed for our notes today, so if you see that in parentheses, I was just trying to draw your attention to that so you didn't always have to, to fumble, it, uh, fumble and find it. But um, yeah, that's not... Uh, dogmatically in parentheses yeah. always. And if you see it not in parentheses, it's wrong. It's, it's totally fine. Most of the time you will not see that, actually. Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. The East, whew, no. The East very much hold to the Trinity. Um, so much so, and that's, again, going back to this schism, it was because they held so strongly to the persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that they refused because, because they, again, they were concerned that, that the West was going down the slippery slope of turning the Spirit into just a force and not allowing him to keep his personhood. So they would say, no, we actually are the ones who have maintained orthodoxy 
and we're the ones who actually view the Trinity in the correct way and in the strong way. Um, so no, they, it, they are very much, they, they probably have a higher Trinitarianism than, than we do, to be quite honest. And yeah, okay, yeah, I know, I was, I was about to do that. All right, one quick thing, actually, can I have that? Um, here's where I was wrong. I'm sorry, Travis isn't here to fully hear it. Uh, I th last week there was a question um, where, and I, and I referenced a diagram, and I was like, I have to like get this diagram in front of you, that thing. The helpful resources, the shield of the Trinity, that is that diagram. And this is linked to the question that was whether Jesus is the Son, or I'm sorry, the Father is the Son, and the Son is the Father, and I got myself all tied up. It's because I was forgetting the most important part, which is the center <laughs> of the triangle that says God. So the Father, if you see, this this is very standard in Trinity, or I can't think of a Christian tradition that doesn't have this understanding of the Trinity. Uh, so the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. That's the personhood. So the outside here, outside of it, is the personhood. And so you would never want to say that the Father is the Son because he is not. He is a distinct person. But, so remember we talked about the, the Trinity is three persons, one substance. That is, that's actually one of the big things that they were coming down on in, at Nicaea and the creeds afterward was how in the world to explain what scripture seemed to be saying. So they landed on three persons, that's the, the three outside, one substance, which is God in the middle. So you can say the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. Is that clear to everybody? Yeah. It does, yes. Yes, so there are, you know, there are lots of, and we'll, we'll get into more of this actually next week. Um, we'll talk through this a little bit more, and we'll talk through some of those things about how is this even possible, and all of the images that people have kind of tried, like an egg or water or like all these different things to try to explain what seems illogical. And we, we'll, we'll talk through that next week. I don't want to take up any more time um, for the Holy Spirit, but that is actually part of what next week is. And we will talk about the heresies that, um, that arose and the church kind of, and it, it's not that they're horrible people. <laughs> we, we hear heretics and we're like, oh, they're awful. They're like the demons of the, ch like the church. Like, it's not that. They were people trying to explain how these things happen. And when it came up in the church, the rest of the church looked at their explanation and they said, yeah, I don't think we can say that because of all of these other reasons. And the only reason that they remained heretics is because they said, no, it's my way. It is the way I'm explaining it. And they didn't submit themselves to the, church, the overall church and that's what made them heretics. So you never have to worry about being a heretic if you're always willing to be like, okay, maybe I'm wrong. So that's just for the record. But we will get to that. We'll get to that more next week. I, I, I will not be able to present a logical defense of the Trinity, though. I will tell you that. <laughs> because it's, it does defy logic on a certain level. But we can talk about the dimensions of God and logic and all of that. Or you and I can talk about it offline. Daniel is next to talk about the works of the Holy Spirit and how he works in our life. All right, well, hopefully in not very much time. Questions <laughs> out of the way with Kim, um, and this is just going to be smooth sailing. That's my hope. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yes, I'm Daniel, Daniel Olander. I used to work with Travis here at the church with the singles, young adults. Uh, really love this church. I'm currently in seminary at Dallas Theological Seminary. I like to say that Kim and I are classmates, uh, but she's in the PhD program and I'm in the master's program, so that's not really honest, uh, but it's just a fun joke that I like to have. Uh, my wife is in the back. Don't turn and look at her. Um, she, she doesn't like all the attention. That's why she's filming me from the back, uh, and I get to be up here because I love attention. So uh, this, it works out well um, for us. 
So, yeah, so I'm going to be talking today about the Holy Spirit in action, how the Holy Spirit works, actions ascribed to the Holy Spirit. But before I dive into that, I have a question for you guys. Uh, I want to ask you, what is a mission statement or a purpose statement? Just what is in general? States, what's your, what you're all about? Exactly. This is what I'm trying to accomplish. That's great. So why would, why would a person or why would an organization have a mission or a purpose statement? Yeah, to, to guide people. So an organization has it to say, here's what we're going to do. Everything we do is going in this direction. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, that's great. Okay, what is Park City's mission statement? Anybody? Follow Jesus every day. That is definitely a part of it, yes. Um, I don't know if this is 100% correct. Uh, I did this from memory, but, l but let me try. Uh, to make disciples of Jesus Christ by rescuing one another from cultural Christianity to follow Jesus every day. That's the mission of Park City's. So everything Park City does, every event, every, every worship gathering, everything they do, the goal is to make disciples of Jesus, to rescue one another from cultural Christianity, to follow Jesus every day. So mission statements give you the purpose behind the actions. They tell you the why behind the what. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we might ask, okay, what is the Holy Spirit's mission statement? What is his purpose statement? And I want to start out with that because that'll be very important as we talk about what he's doing, that we understand why he's doing it. Uh, and so Kim actually already talked uh, about one of the verses I want to point you to, uh, John 15, 26. Uh, John 15, 26 uh, says, and you have this again, all these scripture references are in your notes. Um, John 15, 26, he, the Holy Spirit, will bear witness about me, about Jesus Christ. And then again in John 16, 14, he, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. The Holy Spirit is going to glorify Jesus. So the Holy Spirit's mission is to point people to Jesus. He exists to glorify Jesus, to bear witness about Jesus, or his actions serve uh, to do those things. Uh, and so we're going to see how all the actions that Scripture kind of ascribe to the Holy Spirit are pointing people to Jesus. And so I want us to see that, but uh, not just in the New Testament. And I think this is what's really cool, is that if you look at 1 Peter 1, verses 10 through 12, uh, it talks about how even in the Old Testament, the Spirit of Christ was working in the prophets to reveal, to point towards the Christ who was to come. So even in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is working to point people to Jesus who had yet to be revealed. Uh, so this is the, the actions of the Spirit are pointing people to Jesus. And so I want us to remember that. And as we walk through some various actions, I have a probably non-exhaustive list, not probably, it's definitely non-exhaustive uh, list of things that the Holy Spirit does in, that we see in Scripture. Uh, and we're going to see how those point to Christ. So we're going to walk through. Uh, I have, um, I don't know, a bunch of them, seven maybe, we'll see. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to start out. These kind of go chronologically, uh, but also kind of not, because that didn't exactly work out the way that I wanted it to. Uh, but so we'll start out uh, at the beginning. Uh, we see the Holy Spirit, even from Genesis 1. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is how the Holy Spirit gives life. So this, in the Nicene Creed, uh, when it's talking about the Holy Spirit, it says, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. Uh, and so we see that. We see that both in physical life and in new life in Jesus. So in physical life, we see in Genesis 2, 7, uh, this is God uh, creating man. So he forms him of the dust, and he breathes into man the breath of life. Uh, and so this, uh, the Hebrew word ruach, uh, I can't really do that guttural sound at the end, uh, so forgive me for that. Uh, the ruach of God uh, is breathed into the dust, and that's what makes man alive. Uh, and so that idea of breath being the spirit is one that is a, a thread carried throughout Scripture and that we see uh, time and time again. So we see that, that man was dust until he had 
uh, the spirit of God in him uh, in order to bring him to life. And we see this again later on in Genesis, in Genesis 6, 3. Uh, this is a, a less, uh, this is not a good time in human history. This is on the downhill slope to like the lowest point uh, in human history. Uh, and uh, I gave you the, the verse here again in your notes, Genesis 6, 3. Uh, the, then the Lord said, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. Uh, and so what we see there is that we see the Lord saying, my spirit shall not abide in man forever. His days are 120 years. He's going to die. And there, there seems to be this idea that when the spirit leaves, that life is no longer. And so we see that the Lord, that, that the Holy Spirit is, is giving life. And so physical life uh, and also new life in Christ. And we're going to see that in just a second here. Uh, but first, another action uh, ascribed to him is that the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets of the Old Testament and scripture in the New Testament. Uh, and so uh, when we talk about the Old Testament, we see in Numbers 11, 24 and 25, uh, that prophecy is tied with having the spirit of God. Uh, so Moses, uh, in, in Numbers here, Moses is complaining. He's like, God, why do I have to bear the weight of all this on my own? And so God says, okay, get 70 people uh, and we're all, you're all going to be elders together. Uh, it's going to be great. And what, this, what the Lord does is he takes the spirit that was on Moses and gives it to these other men, these, these people who are going to be elders of Israel, uh, and they begin to prophesy. They begin to be prophets. Now, it says they didn't continue prophesying, uh, but we see that the Holy Spirit being on them is what leads to that prophecy. Uh, and we're not going to talk exactly about what that prophecy was, uh, because that would be, yeah, a whole class in itself. Uh, but just know that it's tied to the Holy Spirit of God being on you, being, being in you and dwelt in you. Uh, and so we see again in the New Testament, uh, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, that God spoke to uh, our fathers in the Old Testament by the prophets and then later uh, by Christ. Uh, in 2 Peter 1.21, we see uh, that no scripture came about by man's own volition, but that men spoke from God, carried by the Spirit. So the Spirit is the co-author along with the uh, writers of the New Testament uh, to author scripture. Uh, and in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, this is probably the only verse you need to remember for this. All scripture is God-breathed uh, and is useful for teaching, training, correcting, and rebuking not in that order uh, of righteousness. Um, and so we see that, that scripture is breathed out by God. Again, we have that idea of, of breath. Uh, the Greek there is theophnustas, uh, which uh, has the word uh, pneuma, uh, like pneumonia, uh, which is not the best example for the spirit. But that idea of breath or, or lungs uh, is, is tied up in that. Uh, so we see that the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets in scripture. Uh, which allows us to trust scriptures. Uh, and that's really important, that, that the Bible that you have, uh, that's in the seat back in front of you that you have at home, is not just like really cool, awesome Proverbs that can lead you to have a better life. It's the inspired word of God. So it's completely trustworthy. It, it, it's so different than any other text that has ever existed. And uh, again, um, I'm tangenting, uh, but we could, uh, we could talk so much about this. Uh, but the Bible is useful to us because it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, now I said uh, that the actions of the Holy Spirit point to Jesus. Well, we see that all scripture points to Jesus. Uh, and we see this, and I really like this, in Luke 24, 27. Uh, Jesus is with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And of course, they don't know it's Jesus. Uh, and they're like, dude, do you not know? Do you not hear what happened? Everything that's happened? In Jerusalem? How, anyway, they're asking Jesus if he knows what's up. And, and Jesus is like, yeah, I got you. Uh, and Jesus interprets the Old Testament to himself. So it's, it's, it's very important in this passage when it says Jesus interprets the scriptures, uh, the scriptures didn't include the New Testament yet, right? This is like day three post-death uh, of Jesus. So there's no New Testament. And Jesus is able to take the scriptures and say, look how these point to me. So th this Old Testament that they have, the, the Hebrew Bible, points to Jesus. And Jesus is able to interpret that. 
because the Holy Spirit inspired the scriptures to point to Jesus. So we see uh, that the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets in scripture. The next action is that the Holy Spirit brings about the incarnation of Jesus. Uh, so here I gave you Matthew 1.18. This is also uh, in other Gospels. Uh, but Jesus, uh, the, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary uh, and she conceived Jesus. And so we see that this incarnation is uh, through the, the, the Holy Spirit uh, is somehow uh, intricately involved in that. Um, and so we, uh, yeah, that again comes from the part of the Nicene Creed uh, Earlier on, when the Nicene Creed is talking about Jesus, uh, that he was conceived uh, of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the way that that points to Jesus is it, you know, incarnates the, the God-man uh, is created. The, the word is uh, incarnate, which is, uh, I think that points to, to Jesus pretty, pretty well. Uh, so the next thing we see uh, is that the Holy Spirit convicts the world. The Holy Spirit convicts the world con concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so the verse for this is John 16, 8 through 11. Uh, you have that again. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but what's interesting about that is that's the first verse uh, in that, that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Uh, and then Jesus, in, in this uh, high priestly prayer, goes on to say, uh, he'll con uh, convict the world concerning sin, by looking at me and seeing where you don't measure up. By righteousness, again, looking at Jesus and seeing the difference between what you're doing and what Jesus is doing. And so he's doing these things by looking at Jesus. Uh, all of this gets pointed to Jesus. And then we have, uh, again, in 1 Thessalonians 1.5, uh, the Holy Spirit convicts people through hearing the gospel. Uh, and so this is the beginning of faith. When, when you and I heard the gospel, we were convicted that we were dead in our sins and that we could not save ourselves. Uh, and that conviction, uh, it seems to be ascribed to the Holy Spirit uh, in, in the Bible. So he convicts people through hearing the gospel. Uh, and then he doesn't just convict people, uh, but he also gives new life in Christ. So this is the next action I want to talk about. Uh, and so uh, for this one, I have a two-part scripture reference that go hand-in-hand hand really nicely. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. Uh, no one says that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. No one says Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. And then we see Romans 10, 9. How does one become a believer? How does one receive new life? Uh, it is by uh, believing in your heart, uh, confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So you can't do that apart from the Holy Spirit. It's not possible. You cannot say that Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. And, and mean it, right? Like anyone can say those words. I'm not trying to say it's some sort of magic incantation or something. If, you, if you're not a believer and you try to say it, are you like going to stumble? I'm not saying any of that. Uh, just to be clear, I don't know why I'm worried that you'll walk away from this with that, but, but now you won't. Uh, Titus 3.5, uh, that the Holy Spirit, uh, we're not saved by our own actions, but by renewal of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so our new life in Christ comes uh, from the Holy Spirit. He ropes us into that. The next action I have is that he indwells believers uh, to make them a part of the body of Christ. Um, whew, I put like four verses on this one. I'm just going to pick and choose. Uh, so this one. Uh, in Acts 1.8, Jesus promises that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you will receive power when he does. Uh, and that's the next part of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, it's promised that the Holy Spirit will come. Uh, and then I want to point you to Acts 19.2 uh, and verse 6. Uh, Paul asks this group of people who believe in Jesus, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And the people are like, we didn't even know there was a Holy Spirit. We just heard about Jesus. Uh, and, he, and so uh, Paul lays his hands on him, and then, and then they get the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of a weird passage. I don't want to get into it. But what you should see uh, is that normally the expectation is that when you believe, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That, that's the normative pattern, uh, and that's what we expect to happen, such that Paul is confused. He has to ask them, wait, didn't you guys get the Holy Spirit? Uh, so that's so... Yeah, we won't dive more into that. Uh, but you get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells you when you believe. 
uh, yeah, and there's, you have some more verses in there that build out that language of indwelling. Uh, the second to last action I have unites and directs the church. Uh, so the Holy Spirit in Acts 13, 2, uh, they're praying, the, the church is praying, the Holy Spirit tells them, hey, set aside Barnabas and Saul for me, uh, for a work that I'm going to send them out on. Uh, so the Holy Spirit is directing the church as they pray. Uh, and then in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13, uh, in one spirit, we were baptized into one body. So the church is united by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the last action I have, uh, and this is kind of a maybe, uh, but it's a fun one. Uh, in Romans 8, 11, uh, we see that the Holy Spirit, uh, just as he gave life to Jesus after Jesus had died, uh, G the Holy Spirit is going to give life to us in a similar way. He will also give life to your mortal body. So one day, uh, we will be physically resurrected, uh, and it seems like that is the working of the Holy Spirit, again, one day in the future. Uh, that's a maybe. Maybe Kim wants to correct me on that, or that's a plug for the eschatology. Well, fair enough. Uh, no, that's actually, um, so the, the, the Ruach, the Spirit, the, that comes in as a part of creation when, when God breathed in um, the breath of life into the dust, the mo the idea that 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 supports the concept of the resurrection says well if god did that once then his spirit can do it again and that's one of the main basis like logical theological philosophical basis for the resurrection so you're right on great Whew. do we want to do application or do we want to do you think you can get we can, we can dive straight into application what do you, uh, do you do how do you question. what what's that i was going to ask if they have questions yeah absolutely any questions on actions of the holy spirit that's what i like to hear all right um yeah so uh real quick diving into uh this is going to mix application and uh the personal working of the spirit so we know that the Spirit is the giver of spiritual gifts, uh, and the Spirit is the one who brings about the fruit of the Spirit in our lives as believers. Uh, okay, and so real quickly, spiritual gifts, not everyone has all of them, uh, and you don't need to, that's okay. The fruit of the Spirit, uh, you should exude all of those characteristics. You don't get to pick and choose. You don't get to say, I want love, but not really peace. Uh, I just want to fight people, but love them while I'm doing it. Um, you're called to have all the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, and so... If this is the actions of the Holy Spirit, what does that mean for us uh, in our life? Uh, if, if the Holy Spirit gives the gifts and gives us the fruit of the Spirit, uh, what does that mean for us? Uh, it means that we can't bring it about on our own. Uh, so coming to church every Sunday is not going to fill you with the fruit of the Spirit. It's just not. Uh, the Holy Spirit needs to work that in your life, and he does that graciously as you pursue a loving relationship with Christ. Uh, so this is why things like spiritual disciplines can, can be used by the Holy Spirit to grow those in you. Uh, and so pursue spiritual disciplines not as a way to control the Spirit, to give you more gifts or more fruit, uh, but as a way that the Spirit promises he will work those out into uh, fruit. Um, yeah, the Holy Spirit uh, teaches us to pray and prays for us when we don't know uh, what to pray for. Uh, and so some of us need to pray more boldly. Right? Some of our prayers are like, God, thank you for today. It was pretty cool. I had a good talk with this person. Uh, pray boldly. God can do amazing things. Uh, and the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to come to God as a father uh, and, and be able to cry, Abba, Father. So pray boldly. Pray more often. God is your father. Uh, and uh, some of us need to change our worship so we can worship as we're filled by the Spirit, uh, as we see in uh, Jude 20. Uh, and some uh, Philippians 3, some other places. Uh, so worship more, more boldly. Uh, this is a great way to worship, hands in your pockets, kind of head down. Uh, but it's great to worship boldly, to worship in the spirit and to just worship as he leads and guides you. Kim? So one other thing, again, I keep hammering away at it, and you'll, I'll say it next week too. Theology is supposed to lead to doxology. Theology is supposed to lead to worship. It just teaches us the right notes to sing. And so um, Daniel gave us some great application of this for our lives, pursuing 
spiritual disciplines, praying boldly, worshiping boldly, worshiping in the spirit. Uh, But we also, one other thing that just comes to mind for me as far as just worshiping the Lord and your own personal worship with the Lord is just the recognition that we're not alone. We've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You know, we have him for all of these good works and we have it. And we have him for salvation, and we will have him for resurrection. But if you're feeling lonely, if you're feeling um, unable, if you're feeling vulnerable, you are not alone. The Father, the Father, Son, and Spirit are with you. God is with you, specifically through the Holy Spirit, in a way that no other humans in human history, previous to Jesus and the previous to Pentecost, really, have ever had the privilege of having God present with you. So just take that and allow that to guide your heart and your worship this week. So, um, Daniel, do you want to pray us out? Yeah, I would love to. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, all the good gifts you give us, but we're especially grateful that you have given us your spirit, uh, that you filled us, with him, uh, Father, that we get to know you, call you Father, even in him, uh, and Father, by his indwelling. Uh, we pray as we go out of here this week that uh, this theology would lead to doxology, Father, that we would worship you, not just on Sunday, but throughout the week, uh, that we would so- strive to live our lives in a way uh, that points people to Jesus, that they would know him and love him and worship him as God. Uh, Father, we pray that you would bring that about in our lives, give us opportunity uh, to share the good news, uh, help us increase in us the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, Father, where there is lack, would you fill us all the more with the Spirit. Uh, Father, be with us uh, by your Spirit, help us to know comfort and peace. Uh, Father, and go before us, lead us and guide us. It's for your beautiful name that we pray.